I'd like to welcome you to the teaching on accomplishing forgiveness. I'm going to point out right up front that the title is not just forgiveness. The title is accomplishing forgiveness. So you might wonder why that little extra word is in there. Part one is learning how to forgive. Part two is actually accomplishing complete forgiveness. We'll learn that that initial step of forgiving someone is crucial, but it's not usually the final end uh, step in the process. Uh, Just because you've said you forgive somebody doesn't mean that it's been fully accomplished in your heart. So that's where that title comes from. Uh, The topic of forgiveness is dear to the heart of all Christians because we have that basic understanding that when we first accepted Christ as Savior, we knew at the deepest level of our hearts that our sins had been forgiven. When we began our walk with the Lord, we learned that we still had to seek forgiveness because just because we became Christians didn't mean we didn't sin anymore or make mistakes or hurt people. It might have been unintentional, but we still have to continually ask people for forgiveness. In fact, 1 John 1, nine is a popular verse for new Christians. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity, from all unrighteousness. That's important to understand because he's faithful and just. We do our part. We make the confession of the sin, and then he's faithful and just not just to forgive us, but to cleanse us from the effects of that sin. So we first learned about forgiveness at salvation, and then we gain a greater understanding even after we're saved that we need to continue to confess our sins and ask for forgiveness, both from God as well as the people that we've hurt. And then we have to seek God's power to break the power of those sins as well as that sinful nature that's still trying to control us. What the Sanfords found out during their decades of experience in prayer ministry is that forgiveness is a multi-layered process. People would come in for prayer, and it was obvious they'd taken the initial steps of forgiving people who hurt them, yet there was still strong evidence of bad fruit in their lives, which indicated that the root still had to exist. So we learn that just because someone has made that initial attempt to forgive, That doesn't mean that forgiveness is actually fully accomplished. When forgiveness reaches that final stage of being accomplished, that means the root has been fully dealt with and the person is free from the bad fruit that comes with holding unforgiveness in our hearts. We easily grasp that holding unforgiveness in our heart as a deterrent to all the abundance that God wants to give us. 1 Peter 3, verse 7 says, "...you husbands likewise conduct your married lives with understanding." Although your wife may be weaker physically, you should respect her as a fellow heir of the gift of life. If you don't, your prayers will be hindered. One version actually says your prayers will be blocked. So that lets us know when these little foxes in our lives, like performance orientation or parental inversion or failing to forgive people, bitter root judgments, they're all obstacles. And we pray to God, but because these obstacles are laying inside our hearts, our prayers are blocked. Our prayers are hindered. God has set up relational guidelines for us. The thing that he loves the most is people. (laughs) That's who, who he created in his own image. I'm sure he loves nature. He loves the oceans. He loves the mountains. But they're not created in his image. We're created in his image. So he set up relational guidelines for us to follow. And when we break those guidelines by failing to forgive people, then we put this hindrance on our lives. Forgiving people is right up at the top of the guidelines that God gives us. So you can look at Mark 11.25. Jesus says, Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. That's a very convicting scene right there. We've got great intentions. We're going to pray. We're spending time alone with the Lord. And then he says, check your heart. If you've got anything against anyone, you have to forgive them right then, right there on the spot. And then your Father in heaven will forgive you. He doesn't say your Father in heaven will forgive you just in case you might happen to have some trespasses. It's a given. (laughs) Your Father in heaven will also forgive you your trespasses. And then the boomerang comes around. If you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. And many of us know the Lord's Prayer from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. There's that rule of reciprocity again. Forgive us our debts to the same extent that we forgive our debtors. 
He goes on to say, Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. But then Jesus adds on top of that, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Wow, so all, this is a profound prayer. It's the Lord's Prayer. Of all the things he could have reemphasized, he said, give us this day our daily bread. He said, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. There are many points covered in the prayer, yet he feels it important to underline after the prayer is over and he says amen, to just come back and revalidate that one point. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't, then he can't. Wow. So from Transformation of the Inner Man, John says, the first necessity of forgiveness derives from the law. This may remind you of the bitter root judgment teaching. You hear about the law often, and here's the first point he's making again. Until forgiveness is affected in the heart, the law of retribution, of sowing and reaping, swings to its inevitable conclusion. We can see this process diagrammed beautifully by the Lord's brother, James, that little epistle that he wrote is power-packed. And right up front in the first chapter, he gets to the point of sin. In verse 13 of James chapter 1, he says, Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. The obvious easy sin to think about there is sexual sin, right? Because the enticement aspect and the seduction aspect our own desires, we get drawn away and seduced. But as you apply it to holding unforgiveness in your heart, there's also a drawing away there as well and an enticement there that says, you know what, I don't have to forgive that person. They're the ones that hurt me. If anybody needs to do forgiving, they're the ones that have to come back and apologize to me for the way they treated me. And until that happens, I don't have to move from this position that I'm holding right now. So we're drawn away by our own desires and we're enticed. And then when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So Jesus is saying unforgiveness is sin. The desire to hold aught in your heart against that person and to withhold your love from them or and somehow discredit them because they hurt you, that gives birth to sin. And it says in James again, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. And this is a form of relational death. If we don't forgive people, there's relational death. The very thing that God loves the most, which is people, we've now put a block and a hindrance up between ourselves and the other person. And now there's a wall. There's ice. It doesn't mean that what they did was okay. No one's justifying how they hurt us. But what Jesus is saying is you've got to make a choice now. You can either hold on to that anger and that resentment and that bitterness and even that hatred that you're holding towards the person who hurt you. That is one of your choices. But you also have a choice to forgive them, and that's clearly the Father's will that we choose that second choice, which is to let them go and forgive them and realize, but for the grace of God, we could have done the very same thing that they did to us, we could have done to someone else. Verse 16 in James chapter 1 says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. So again, he's warning us, don't be deceived. There is a law of retribution. If you hold unforgiveness in your heart and you fail to forgive someone, there's going to be a comeback to that. And you're being deceived. That is not a gift from God. The good gifts are forgiveness. That good and perfect gift comes from God. There's no changing. Like if you think about the variation and the shadow of turning that we read about, there's no shadow of turning. Well, you can picture the sun up in the sky at noon. There's no shadows. As the sun starts to move, we're actually it's the earth moving, but it looks like the sun's moving. Now all of a sudden it starts to form shadows. God's saying, I'm even more stable than the universe. Because even though you're in motion and you're moving, that's creating shadows. I don't move. There is no variation, no shadow of turning with God. Back to the Sanford's in Transformation Under Man, John says, the legality of the universe demands resolution. Every anger in a family is a stimulus. So if you grew up in a big family of brothers and sisters, mom and dad, there's always going to be points of disagreement as you're growing up. And John's calling that point of disagreement a stimulus. And every stimulus engenders a response, whether we acknowledge that consciously or we stuff it and repress it. 
You can think of many times your older brothers and sisters might have been picking on you, kids on the playground picking on you, and you come home and you expect to get some sympathy and you don't get any sympathy. You may not consciously respond to that, but even if you repress those feelings, they don't go away. They get stuffed down into a box and they're going to surface again later. So the question is, why do we do that? Why do we repress? It's usually a sign that we don't feel safe to share what we're feeling inside. And this isn't just when we're children. This is also as adults. But so much of how we behave as adults goes back to our childhood. If we grew up in a home where we were able to express ourselves and, and there was no retribution and punishment for that, then we're not going to suppress as often. Unfortunately, many of us didn't grow up in that kind of home. We grew up in a more of a controlling kind of culture where certain things were allowed to be said and others were not. And we learned the rules around that real quickly. We might have learned that an honest expression of our feelings and opinions would bring swift punishment and retribution. Now, that's not to say that we don't have to be respectful when we disagree with somebody. But when you're not allowed to express your feelings openly, that's a real warning sign of an unhealthy culture. I had a client that used to have a plaque on his wall when I would go visit his office. I always remember seeing it. He said, the beatings will continue until morale improves. And that really sums it up. If you're in a culture where you can't express your feelings openly and honestly, even in a respectful way, it kind of reminds you of communist China or any one of those repressive cultures where Big Brother is going to just keep on repeating the line over and over again. The beatings will continue until morale improves. Doesn't mean you agree with what they're saying, but you finally give up trying and you don't even try to attempt to express your feelings at some point. In a healthy culture, on the other side, members learn that disagreement is normal. That's a healthy part of all relationships, as long as it's done within the boundaries of respect. And therefore, forgiveness is not that big a deal. When you're in open dialogue with people, it might get a little heated sometimes, but there's conflict resolution in the Word of God. It doesn't say that we never disagree. It says when we do disagree, we learn how to resolve that conflict. And one of the main ways is to ask for forgiveness. If you're out working on a secular job, it's very different in the world than it is in the church. Typically in the church, people get along well. And if there's a problem, they'll ask for forgiveness, they'll apologize, and they'll seek a brother or sister in the Lord and say, I really didn't mean to do that. I'm sorry if it came across the wrong way. Will you forgive me? That would be in a healthy church at least. But out in the world, when you're out on your job, for most of us at least, it's not a very strong Christian culture. And it's rare to hear people apologize, in at least the one I work in. If somebody's upset about something, they don't mind lacing into you, and you never hear them come back two days or three days later and say, you know, I really lost my cool. I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? So when we do this, we really do become the light of the world. It's not that we're perfect people. We don't expect anyone who's a Christian to never make a mistake out on their job. But one of the things that separates us in the world is that when we do make a mistake, we have a pliable heart. We can go to that person and say, you know, I'm so sorry. I was yelling on the phone the other day. I lost my cool. That's not who I really want to be. And I ask you to forgive me if the noise I was making was impacting the work you were trying to get done. I've done that many times, you know, not that exact scenario, but the people look at me and they're shocked. And they say, like, what planet are you from? Because nobody does that. Well, the answer is it's not a different planet, but it is a different kingdom. The world is operating under one set of rules. We're operating under the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus said right in the prayer, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We operate off the rules of the kingdom of God. And that should be so compelling that the Bible says we should be provoking people to jealousy through our actions and through the way we live our lives. I hope that's happening where you work. If we go back to Matthew chapter 18, we can see conflict resolution also spelled out. This is the Lord speaking. He says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. That's called conflict resolution. That's seeking the other person out. If your brother sins against you, maybe they said something that hurt your feelings. You're not supposed to just repress that feeling that you have. You're supposed to go seek them out one-on-one -on -one and tell them the thing that you have an issue with between you and him alone. And if he hears you, wonderful. You've gained your brother. 16 says, but if he will not hear, then take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. For some of us, that's a very hard thing to do. We haven't been trained well in conflict resolution. But conflict is a normal part of life, and so is forgiveness, both asking for it and receiving forgiveness when you've done something wrong. 
So if somebody approaches you and says, you know, that thing you said to me that really hurt my feelings, you've got to be able to understand that getting defensive at that point is also a pretty big red flag. We have to say, well, I'm sorry. I ask you to forgive me if I hurt your feelings. It's certainly not what I meant, but if that's how you took it, I would ask you to forgive me for that. So by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Matthew 18, 16. You know how it is. Sometimes when it's just one-on-one with the other person, you both kind of dig in and, and take your positions and get defensive. But if you can bring two or three more mature Christians along and arbitrate and just kind of mediate your discussion, then cooler heads typically prevail. That's a scene from the Bible. In the Old Testament, the elders would sit at the gate and they would help bring wisdom, godly, eternal wisdom from the Word of God. You could think of Solomon, right? That's exactly what happened when the two women were disagreeing about the baby. They sought out the king because they knew he had wisdom. And he came up with a brilliant answer. Won't go into that one right now. But that was great conflict resolution. Verse 17 gives it another step. The first step was one-on-one. The second step was take two or three more people with you. The third step in verse 17 says, if he refuses to hear them, then you have to take it to the whole church. And if he refuses to hear the whole church, then let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector, which you have to remember in Jesus' day, the heathen and tax collectors were not dismissed. They still witnessed to, to heathen and tax collectors, but treat them as you would an unbeliever and try to witness to them and convince them that Christ is the answer and it's the right way to go. Verse 18, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So binding and loosing, think of keys and locks, right? When you bind something, when you put chains around someone and put a lock on it, you have bound them. Jesus is giving us keys now that we can either open locks or we can shut locks. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So if you're going to hold that person in a prison of unforgiveness, they're bound in there. But you've also then shut the heavens over your life in that area and your prayers are going to be hindered. Verse 19 says, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth, all right, so that's a different conclusion. That's not where they walked away upset with each other, but they came together over a disagreement and they agreed on it. They came to resolution. They asked for forgiveness. Forgiveness was extended. Jesus says when that happens, anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father. So maybe they ended in prayer. And they said, Lord, put this thing behind us. We don't want any bitterness in our hearts to be held against each other. We want to move forward from here in power and strength in our relationship. Jesus said, whatever you ask, that will be done by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, key word, gathered together in agreement, assembled, it says, right? Don't forsake the assembling together. So you're gathered together in my name. I am there in the midst of them. There is power in agreement. There's power in unity. There's power in extending forgiveness and receiving forgiveness. I'm going to read you something from one of the prayer ministers on the Elijah House staff, a man named Rob Morissette, who wrote a little piece called Forgiving Our Debtors. He says, even though we talk frequently about forgiveness, most of us find it hard to define it in a practical way. What does it really mean to forgive? Since doing so is central to the transformation process, we should certainly know. Forgiveness is often defined as letting go of past hurts or changing a person's attitudes towards someone else. But how do we do that? How do we let go? One day the Lord showed me a definition of forgiveness I had never fully seen before. It comes from the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 12. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. When we have unforgiveness in our heart toward another, we're holding that person in debt. Thus, when we truly forgive, we're proclaiming effectively, I've canceled your debt. You don't owe me anything any longer. Many of us give evidence to our unforgiveness without even knowing it when we say things like, I deserve an apology. He owes me an apology. But if we have truly forgiven, even the debt of an apology is removed. When someone's in debt to us through unforgiveness, our heart records what that person owes us. Think about getting your credit card statement in the mail and it shows you what the balance is. And think about how great it is when you get one of those statements and it's a zero balance because your last payment, you completely paid it off. 
Well, when someone's in debt to us through unforgiveness, our heart has one of those statements that shows what that person owes us. But not only does what is owed get stored in our hearts, so do the hurts and the negative messages that are associated with that debt. These don't go away until that debt gets paid in full. So here's an illustration. A father promises his son he will leave work early to take him to a baseball game. After school, the boy excitedly waits by the front door for dad to show up, but dad never calls. The boy's terribly disappointed. He's told his friends about the trip. When dad does come home, he fails to even acknowledge his son's hurt and brushes the whole thing off. The son feels rejected, and the message is written in his heart, I must not be important. Since this isn't the first time dad has done something like this, the son is likely to be tempted to build up resentment and unforgiveness towards his father. In his heart, the unforgiveness said, Dad owes me. He owes me to keep his promise and to admit that he did wrong to me. Because the son now holds his father in debt to himself, that event and the feelings and the messages that are stored in his heart never go away. They can only go away when forgiveness is fully accomplished. So time goes on, and this unresolved issue is buried in his heart. That little boy's heart buries this memory with all other similar issues, forgotten to the conscious mind, but still there. Later in life, that son is now a grown man, and he finds himself overreacting when people don't come through on their promises. And he finds himself experiencing angry rages and even depression. Why? because the feelings and messages are still strongly alive within his heart, and they get tapped into when circumstances, even as an adult many years later, when circumstances trigger those emotions in his heart. In those unforgiven areas of our heart, we're not only holding someone in debt to us, but we're also unable to receive what we really need in each area. We need affirmation and love, positive words and comfort, the very thing that we think is owed to us, and yet our prayers are hindered, they're blocked. Rather than receive positive messages, our heart is more likely to receive messages in line with the negative ones written there through unforgiveness. In these areas, our heart becomes closed to the Lord and others around us. That little boy, think of it, he has like a closed fist. In unforgiveness, it's as if we're shaking our fist at our father, you owe me, you owe me, demanding to receive what he'd ever got as a little child, yet we're holding so tightly to that pain that we want to be rid of that it won't let go. We're unable to receive the very thing that we demand because our hand is not open. When the Lord wants to come and pour his love and healing into our hurt, we're unable to receive the very thing that we're longing for. We can only receive a small portion of his love because through unforgiveness, we're still waiting for those who hurt us to pay up and to come through. It's as if we're saying to the Lord, no, it's okay, Lord, you don't have to give me that love. I'm waiting for so-and-so because he owes me. Back to 1 John 1, 9 again. If we confess that sin, God will be faithful and just to forgive that sin and cleanse us from the unrighteousness and iniquity that's attached with that unforgiveness. The first part of that verse if we confess our sins, that describes our part. It's our job to admit and confess that sin. The rest, though, he is faithful and just to forgive us. That's his job. He cleanses us. He gets rid of the bitterness and the unforgiveness, the resentment and the hatred. We must simply admit these sins and make a choice to cancel someone's debt through forgiveness. When we do, the Lord will heal us, removing that pain and all the negative messages that were in our heart. So now all of a sudden the statement comes in the mail and there's a zero balance. And when you see that person, you start thinking the Holy Spirit will prompt you and say, they don't owe me anything. But for the grace of God, I could have done the same exact thing they did to me. I release them. I let them go. I pray, Lord, when I look at that person, help me have compassion. When Jesus looked at the crowds, he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. When you look at this person who hurt me, you see them with compassion. I want your eyes when I look at them. I don't want my eyes. I want your eyes. And I want to see what you see in them. The person who needs to know you more. And one of the ways they'll get to know you more is through me. If my prayers stop being blocked and hindered because I release them and they don't owe me anything anymore. I'm going to shift over to Luke chapter 17. If you have a Bible that has headings in it, you might see the heading in this portion of scripture is called the unprofitable servant. 
And some people get confused around this unprofitable servant verse. I've learned as a pastor over the years, it's one of those potentially confusing portions of Scripture. But I think if we read it in context of this message on accomplishing forgiveness, it might help you understand it. Luke 17, 1 says, Then Jesus said to the disciples, It's impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. So there's a clear tie to this whole topic of forgiveness. Terrible if you're the one who causes the offense, but there are going to be offenses. It's impossible that they shouldn't come. So learn how to resolve the conflicts. Take heed to yourselves, he said in verse 3. If your brother sins against you, you can rebuke him. You can go to him, like it said in Matthew 18, go to him one-on-one. -on -one, and if he repents, don't hold a grudge. Verse 3 says, if he repents, forgive him. And know what? In verse 4, it says, if he sins against you seven times in a day. Seven being a very critical number to the Jews because it was the completion of a cycle. Seven steps, and then the eighth was the new beginning. So seven times is also symbolic. You can take it literally, but also symbolically. If a whole cycle goes through and you have to keep on forgiving him, and he keeps saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Now the apostles are standing around listening to this. In verse 5, it says, The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. <laughs> Like, I think sometimes this is the first time they ever might have said, Oy vey, are you kidding me? No way we could forgive them seven times. And verse 6 then says, So the Lord said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now hopefully after the bitter root judgment teaching, you have a whole new perspective on roots. And when Jesus says, pull something up by the roots now, he's not just talking about a plant and this mulberry tree here. In the context of these six verses that we've just read, he's talking about your brother sinning against you, and you have to have the supernatural ability to forgive them seven times. And that's hard. That's a tree. That's got roots in it. And I think he's specifically referring, if you have just a little bit of faith to trust in me, as small as a little mustard seed, you could even say to the sin that's represented by this mulberry tree, which is unforgiveness, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and that tree would obey you. So if you think of the tree as unforgiveness with roots in your heart, all you need is enough faith of a mustard seed to say, well, I'm going to do it God's way. As much as it feels wrong, it almost feels like I'm letting this person get away with something here if I forgive them because I want to punish them by holding them in unforgiveness. No, that's not the way of Jesus. That thing's going to be uprooted and thrown into the sea. And here's the verse that can be a little confusing to people. Verse 7 and which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he's come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? But will he rather not say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me until I have eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink? So people read this and they're thinking, well, maybe he's starting a whole new topic, Jesus. You know, the first six verses were about forgiveness, but now he's changing the subject. I don't think so. I think he's just trying to give us an analogy by saying, which of you, you're the boss, you've got a servant out in the field, when he comes in, who's the boss and who's the servant here, right? The boss doesn't say to the servant, let me prepare you something. The servant says to the boss, I'm going to prepare you something first. And then does the boss, in verse 9, say, does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, when you have done all those things which are commanded you, this is a clear reference to forgiveness. Right? We're not supposed to go to God after we've forgiven somebody and say, oh, I need a badge right now. I need to be honored as a great Christian because I just did this impossible thing by forgiving someone who hurt me. No, this is supposed to be a part of our daily lives. This forgiveness piece by not allowing it to take root in our hearts and just dealing with it on an ongoing basis. That's the expected result. So likewise, he says in verse 10, when you've done all those things which are commanded you, right? This isn't a suggestion. He says it's commanded. Just say this, we're unprofitable servants. We've done what was our duty to do. I'd like to go back to some Old Testament scripture and think about how this plays out in a real family situation. 
I've been a worship leader for many years. Um, when I got saved, I was a musician, had been playing out in bands. And thankfully, when I got saved, I got plugged into Christian music and was given opportunities to lead worship. So I think most people who lead worship have studied the life of David at some time because he wrote so many of the Psalms. And David's such a key worshiper in the Bible and prophet and a great hero of the faith. But he didn't have the greatest family life. He fell into besetting sins, especially having too many wives, and that resulted in terrible problems. And we all know about what happened when he went up on the rooftop and observed Bathsheba. It played itself out in many other ways as well within his family. He had multiple sons and daughters, stepsons, stepdaughters, the way they interacted with each other. In 2 Samuel 13, it talks about three of his children. One of his daughters named Tamar, one of his sons named Absalom, and one of his sons named Amnon. In 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1, it says, David had a son named Absalom and a son named Amnon, and Absalom had a beautiful sister named Tamar. Amnon loved her. Tamar was a virgin. Amnon made himself sick just thinking about her because he could not find any chance to be alone with her. Amnon had a friend named Jonadab, who was a very clever man. He asked Amnon, Son of the king, why do you look so sad day after day? Tell me what's wrong. Amnon told him, I love Tamar, the sister of my half-brother Absalom. Jonadab said to Amnon, Go to bed and act as if you're sick. Then your father will come to see you. Tell him, please let my sister Tamar come in and give me food to eat. Let her make the food in front of me so I can watch and eat it from her hand. So Amnon went to bed and acted sick. When King David came in to see him, Amnon said to him, Please let my sister Tamar come in. Let her make me some food, then I'll eat from her hand. David sent for Tamar in the palace and said, Go to your brother Amnon's house and make some food for him, for he's sick. So Tamar went to her brother's house. He was in bed. Tamar took some dough and pressed it together with her hands, and she made special cakes while he watched, and she baked them. Then she took the pan and served him, but he refused to eat. He said to his servants, All of you leave me alone. So they left him alone. Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into the bedroom so I may eat from your hand. Tamar took the cakes she had made and brought them to her brother Amnon in the bedroom. She went to him so he could eat from her hands, but Amnon grabbed her. He said, Sister, come and lie with me. Tamar said to him, No, brother, don't force me. This should never be done in Israel. Don't do this shameful thing. I could never get rid of my shame. And you'll be like one of the shameful fools in Israel. Please talk with the king and he'll let you marry me. But Amnon refused to listen to her. He was stronger than she was, so he raped her. Verse 15 of 2 Samuel 13 says, After that, Amnon hated Tamar. He hated her more than he had loved her before. Amnon said to her, Get up and leave. Tamar said to him, No, sending me away would be worse than what you've already done. But he refused to listen to her. He called his young servant back in and said, Get this woman out of here and away from me. Lock the door after her. So his servant led her out of the room and bolted the door after her. Tamar was wearing a special robe with long sleeves because the king's virgin daughters wore this kind of robe. To show how upset she was, Tamar put ashes on her head, tore her special robe, and put her hand on her head. And then she went away crying loudly. Her brother Absalom said to her, Has Amnon your brother been with you? Be quiet now, my sister. He's your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. When King David heard all this, he was furious. Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. Well, that's a story that's very difficult to read and to try to identify with the pain that Tamar was feeling. The dysfunction in this family, one father but multiple wives and different children and just the violation that takes place. I would dare say most of us listening to this teaching haven't been through something that severe, but it still points to the fact that something terrible happened and all three of these people involved now are going to have to make decisions about how they move forward. Tamar, if we brought it forward to today, would need lots of ministry, lots of prayer ministry, because she was terribly violated. Amnon, who committed the deed, would also have a tremendous amount of ministry to get to the point where he could go to his sister and ask for forgiveness and admit the horrible thing that he had done to her. But Absalom also has a decision in his heart. He's got to guard the hatred that's forming in his heart, and he can either release his brother 
Or he can take vengeance against his brother. And we're not too encouraged by what we just read at the end, where it said, Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister, Tamar. That's the seed that James talks about that starts to give birth to sin, and when it's fully grown, brings forth death. It's exactly what's going to happen in this part of this dysfunctional family. Verse 28, later on, it says, Absalom ordered his men, listen, when Amnon is in high spirits from drinking wine, I say to you, strike Amnon down and then kill him. Don't be afraid. So that's exactly what happened. Just what James predicted, that sin was conceived in his heart, and when it was fully grown, it matured and gave birth to death. And he had his own half-brother killed. So now Absalom flees. We've got a sister who's just been raped by a half-brother. We've got a murder that took place in this family. And now we have Absalom separated from his father, David. It says in 2 Samuel 13, David mourned for his son every day. That was verse 37 and 39. And King David longed to go to Absalom. So not only was he mourning the death of Amnon, he's also longing. The grief is also towards his son, Absalom. For he had been comforted concerning Amnon because he was dead. And then in 14, we've got this kind of a standoff. When we get to chapter 14, Absalom is still somewhat banished because he can't come back because of the murder he committed. And King David is longing to see him, but he's conflicted. If he brings him home, he's going to have to face trial for the murder of Amnon. So it says in chapter 14, verse 1, Joab, who was one of King David's generals, perceived that the king's heart was concerned about Absalom. So Joab sent to Tekoa and brought from there a wise woman and said to her, Please pretend to be a mourner. Put on mourning apparel. Don't anoint yourself with oil, but act like a woman who's been mourning for a long time for the dead. Go to the king and speak to him in this manner. So Joab told her what to say. Put these words in her mouth. Verse 4. And when the woman of Tekoa spoke to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and prostrated herself and said, Help, O king. The king said to her, this is David, What troubles you? She answered, Indeed, I'm a widow. My husband is dead. Now your maidservant had two sons, and the two fought with each other in the field. There was no one to part them, but the one struck the other and killed him. And now the whole family has risen up against your maidservant, and they said, Deliver him the one who struck his brother, that we may execute him for the life of his brother whom he killed, and will destroy the heir also. So, king, they would extinguish my ember that is left, and leave to my husband neither name nor remnant on the earth. Then the king said to the woman, Go to your house, and I will give orders concerning you. Verse 10, the king said, Whoever says anything to you, bring him to me, and he shall not touch you any more. Verse 11, then she said, Please let the king remember the Lord your God, and do not permit the avenger of blood to destroy any more, lest they destroy my son. And David said, As the Lord lives, not one hair of your son shall fall to the ground. Therefore the woman said, Please let your maidservant speak another word to my lord the king. So David said, Say on. Verse 13, So the woman said, Why then have you schemed such a thing against the people of God? For the king speaks this thing as one who is guilty, in that the king does not bring his banished one home again. Oh boy, we see what happened. King David got set up by Joab, and this woman beautifully played the role that Joab asked her to play. She pretended she had two sons, but in reality she was mirroring what happened in David's family. And now she turns to him and says, if you're willing to make an exception in my case and issue an executive order so that my remaining son does not have to be brought to justice, why then are you not doing that in your own family? But she takes it a step further and said, why have you schemed such a thing against the people of God? For the king is guilty in that he doesn't bring the banished one home. So Absalom is banished. Now, this is a little tricky, right? Because it doesn't mean that what Absalom did was okay. That's not what Jesus is teaching about forgiveness, but that's how some people interpret this, that somehow if we forgive people who hurt us, that we're letting them get away with something. That's clearly not what Jesus meant. But back to the story, I just really want you to focus on what she's about to say again now in response to David. In verse 13, she confronted him, but then in verse 14, I think one of the reasons she's called the wise woman of Tekoa, 
she makes this incredible statement. She says, For we will surely die and become like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered again. Yet God does not take away a life, but he devises means so that his banished ones are not expelled from him. I've got to give credit to a wonderful teacher named Mark Hamby who really expounded on this teaching many years ago for me, and I never forgot it. The first time I heard it, it struck such a chord in my heart. But his comparison when he was teaching on this verse was when she says, we will surely die and become like water spilled on the ground. It's a picture of time passing by. So it had been three years since this event had happened where Absalom killed his brother Amnon. David had been separated from his son for three years, and she uses this word banished. And when we hold unforgiveness in our heart towards people, that's what we're doing. We're banishing them. We're keeping them away. And she said, well, think about time is like spilling water on the ground. It sinks into the sand, and you can never gather it back up again. So if you're holding unforgiveness in your heart, which is causing you to banish people, because you can't let them go, because they still have an account balance in your account, and you're saying, no, they owe me. And time keeps going by, like water going through the ground and never being able to be recaptured again. And then she says, but God devises means so that his banished ones are not expelled from him. That verse has come back to me many times over the years as I've thought about reconciliation of relationships, that God devises means so that his banished ones would not be expelled from him. And one of the primary means he uses is forgiveness. Holy Spirit will come in and work on the hardness of our hearts and soften those stony places with his oil. We yield ourselves to the work of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit so that we can be cleansed from those iniquities of the sins of unforgiveness. Many of you may know about a well-known Christian minister named Corey Ten Boom. She's famous in Christian circles for the story about how she and her family helped many Jews escape from Hitler's occupation during World War II. Whenever I think about the topic of forgiveness, I think about Corey and her family, especially her father and her sister Betsy. They were a very innocent Dutch family. The dad was a watchmaker, and Corey was the first woman uh, watchmaker ever licensed in Holland. And they lived together. The father and the two older sisters, Betsy and Corey, lived together with their dad. Big family, small town. Everybody knew each other. And uh, it's just a wonderful story. I highly recommend it if you can uh, read the book. It's called The Hiding Place. And then she did a follow-up book about their story called Tramp for the Lord. What made them special is that they made a decision. Instead of looking the other way when Hitler came in and was persecuting and killing the Jews, they made a decision to risk their lives and use their home as a hiding place. They built a false wall and, and created a room upstairs in the house so that when the Jews were in process of leaving and using the underground to escape. They allowed their house to be a safe house where people could be hidden. But of course, that put them at great danger. And eventually they themselves got caught and they themselves were taken to the concentration camps. It was only a miracle of God that Corey was the one person from the family who was released from the prison camp. It was called Ravensbrook. All the other people she was in there with were killed. Then she went on to travel around the world ministering about Jesus' love, but also on the topic of forgiveness. So what I'm about to read is a section from the second book, the sequel to Hiding Place. This was called Tramp for the Lord, where Corey was back in Germany after the war, preaching to the people in Germany who were devastated, just emotionally devastated by the realization of what had happened through Hitler and just the horrendous crimes that were committed. She was there to talk about Jesus and forgiveness and his unconditional love and then the supernatural ability that God gives us to forgive other people who've hurt us. So this is what I call Shaking Hands with the Prison Guard from Tramp for the Lord by Corey Ten Boom. She says, It was in a church in Munich that I first saw him, a balding older man with his hat between his hands. People were filing out of the church basement where I had just spoken. It was 1947 and I had come from Holland to a defeated Germany with the message that God forgives. It was the truth that they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land. I gave them one of my favorite mental pictures. Maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, I like to think that that is where forgiven sins were thrown. When we confess our sins, I said, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. And even though I cannot find a scripture for it, I believe God then places a sign up there that says, No fishing allowed. 
The solemn faces in the audience stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. When the meetings ended, people would stand up in silence, in silence collect their wraps, and in silence leave the room. And that's just how this meeting was going, but that's when I saw him, a man working his way forward against the others who were leaving the meeting. One moment I saw the overcoat and brown hat that he was wearing, and then the next minute I had a flashback to a blue uniform and a visored hat with its skull and crossbones. It came back to me with a rush. That huge room at the concentration camp with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic piles of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, her ribs sharp beneath her parchment skin, thinking, Betsy, how thin you are. The place was Ravensbrook, and the man that was making his way forward had been a guard, one of the most cruel guards at Ravensbrook. Now he was in front of me in a church basement after a talk I had just given about forgiveness, and his hand was thrust out to shake mine. He said, A fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know, as you say, that all of our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, Corey says, and I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than extend my hand to take his. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. I was face to face with one of my captors, and my blood seemed to freeze. He went on to say, You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk. I was a guard there. I thought, no, he didn't remember me. And then he went on, But since that time I've become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things that I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fraulein? And again his hand came out to shake mine. He said, Will you forgive me? And I stood there, I whose sins had again and again been forgiven, and I could not forgive. My sister Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there with his hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who've injured us. Jesus said, If you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 15. I knew it, not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. This was 1947, but since the end of the war, I had had a home in Holland for the victims of Nazi brutality. Those people who were able to forgive their former enemies were able also to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what their physical scars. But those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was really as simple as that, and as horrible as that. And I still stood there with a coldness clutching my heart, unable to shake this man's hand. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. So I prayed silently, Jesus, help me. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to mine. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. It was like electric current that started in my shoulder and raced down my arm and sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother. I forgive you, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did at that moment. But even so, I realized it was not my love. I had tried that and didn't have the power. Now, this was the power of the Holy Spirit, as recorded in Romans chapter 5, verse 5. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. That's the end of the quote from the book, but I just have to say, there have been many times in my life when I've gone back mentally through that picture of 
this man holding his hand out to shake hers and her having to drill down to the deepest part of her heart to ask for forgiveness and to ask for supernatural ability. And look what happened. It was just miraculous the way God poured his love through her. And the irony is she was released from a prison of unforgiveness. Now, it probably wouldn't have ever occurred to her to go try to find that man. But we would like to think that because God loves us so much and and God knew that she was still harboring unforgiveness towards this man, that if she couldn't go find him, God was going to send this man to her. You might think that's a little mean, but it's really not. God sent this man to her so that she could see something about her own heart that still wasn't right, that still wasn't pure, wasn't sanctified. And it was holding her back. It was causing her prayers to be hindered because it acted like one of those little foxes that spoil the vine. So because God loved her, he brings this former prison guard right in front of her and forces the issue to see that she couldn't do it in her own strength. John Sanford has a similar revelation about what happened in Gethsemane in the Bible. So I'm going to turn to a quote from Transformation to the Inner Man again, and it's what he calls the Gethsemane prayer. I'll start with a quote from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Paul says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So if we just pause for a minute and think back to that story, Corey Ten Boom survived the prison camps. So many people died in those prison camps. So somehow she was miraculously delivered, not to just go back to Holland and live life happily ever after, but in her mind, no, she had to go and tell that story to the rest of the world. And she did lived to be 91 years old and was ministering right up until her last days with this message of God's love. And that's really what Paul is saying here. God has reconciled us to himself through Christ, and now he's given us a ministry of reconciliation. So we pass on that word to others. Back to 2 Corinthians 5, he says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So John Sanford goes on to say, In the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus drank the cup of our sins. He reaped in his own body all the consequences of each and every sin committed in the past, present, and future. He felt the full penalty of every murder, rape, perversion, lie, and betrayal. He bore this in his body to the extent that it caused his capillaries to burst in the garden. But that was just the physical part of what he was doing. Emotionally and spiritually, he became more of humanity into himself. He had never experienced separation from the Father. In the fullness of taking all our sin into himself, he then qualified to stand in our place. He was for the first time sin, and the Father could not look upon him. In the depth of his separation, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His agony was not just physical, but spiritual and emotional as well. He was fully identified with mankind and thus for the first time fully separated from God the Father. Legally, because he was God and had the power to do so, Jesus transcended time and space and became us, every person in the past, present, and future. He took into his body all the sins we had ever committed or would commit. If he had not done that, the cross would have been of little effect. He had to become as we are in order to take the punishment which the law prescribed. The God of the universe suffered intense agony and pain out of his intense love for his creatures. This prayer in which he became us is an integral part of the work of the cross. It was the act of becoming us that nearly killed him in the garden. This work fulfilled the legal requirement of the law that sin must result in death. God is a legal God, and he fulfilled his own law. By accepting his substitutionary death as my own, I can then set in motion that same law of reaping and reap for myself, not sin, but his righteousness. That makes me a very grateful person. I'm basing my confidence on God's own legality. As an individual with my own hurts, I need to go into the Garden of Gethsemane figuratively 
as often as I need to. And there, I have to identify with the pain of the other person, with my part in the pain and my part in tempting someone to wound me. I have to experience the other person's pain and God's pain, and I am devastated by that because their pain becomes my own. So we just pause for a minute and think about the picture John's painting here. He said, Jesus went into the garden, and there he identified with our sin. It's almost as if he looked across from where he was kneeling, and he saw humanity. And instead of judging us and being angry at us for what he was about to have to go through, he identified with our pain. And what John is saying here is that when we know that we have ought in our heart towards somebody and God is asking us to forgive that person, we have to get down on our knees and get back in that garden of Gethsemane and look across and see that other person across from us and experience their pain. Just like Jesus experienced our pain for all of humanity, we have to experience the pain of the person who hurt us. This is very hard to do. And in a nutshell, that's what Corrie ten Boom did. when she said, supernaturally, Lord, you're going to have to pour your love through me because in the natural, I have no way that I could ever forgive this man who's now stretching his hand forth to want to shake mine. So she figuratively got in the garden and identified with his pain and said, I can at least stretch forth my hand. I may not have the feeling right now, God, but I can at least stretch forth my hand. And when she took that initial step, God did the rest. She said it was like electric current flowing through her. And then that warmth that many of us have experienced of God's presence in our lives and that release of lifting that bondage of unforgiveness and hatred that she was holding towards this man. So John Sanford goes back to say, once I can feel the anguish of the other person when I'm on my knees in the garden, then I can forgive. Or I might have to deeply repent either for myself or for the other person. This removes that good guy, bad guy syndrome, meaning they owe me an apology. They're the ones that are supposed to come and ask me for forgiveness. No, that puts us in the good guy, bad guy scenario. And John's saying we should avoid that. We can't elevate ourselves because we know the cost of sin. Corey Ten Boom wasn't saying, I'm better than you, Mr. Prison Guard, but I'll do the Christian thing and I'll extend my hand. Now, when, when we recognize this process in the garden, we say to ourselves, you know, but for the grace of God, I could have done the exact same thing that this person did if I were in his shoes. But for the grace of God, I have to extend forgiveness to him because I make mistakes and there are going to be times when I need people to forgive me. So finishing John's thoughts on the Garden of Gethsemane and that prayer, he says this type of identification and repentance is what we teach people and help others to do. This identification with the other is the most effective thing in bringing about deep repentance and powerful forgiveness. It works because God is a righteous God and he does not nullify his own law. He fulfills it. So as we wrap up the teaching here, I'm just going to finish with another quote from the book and then we'll pray. John says, we said earlier that if bad fruit persists, forgiveness is not yet accomplished. A person may, however, have fully forgiven the one who initially wounded them, but there still could be some destructive resulting practices. What that means is that that person still has to forgive someone else, namely himself or herself. We cannot achieve destruction of our inner practices until forgiveness of self restores the capacity to trust and let go. And I'm happy to tell you, church, now being the pastor again, uh, in my own experience, this is a, a pivotal one that you've got to be able to forgive yourself And the last one that John is going to mention is that we could be angry at God. I know that sounds silly that we would have to forgive God because he's never done anything wrong. He hasn't committed a sin. But if the perception in our heart was that he has failed us somehow and we're harboring anger and resentment towards God, then we got to get in the garden and picture him on the other side and forgive him as well. So just a quick summary. We're going about our lives, everything appears to be fine, but all of a sudden God surfaces something that proves that the fruit that we're experiencing has got a root of unforgiveness. So that's where he enlightens us and Holy Spirit shows us that the fruit is because there's a root that exists. We then have to go down into the garden and we forgive the person who hurt us. And after that's been accomplished, we have to forgive ourselves. And then finally, we have to check our hearts and make sure that we're not still angry at God and that we forgive him if necessary. Quoting again from the book, John says, Proverbs 19.3 says, When a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. Note again that word heart, the mind protests, 
How can I ever be angry at God? He's so perfect. He's never done anything wrong to me. But that's not what the heart says. The heart perversely cries out, Oh yeah, if you were really a good father, you wouldn't have let me fall this far. Or in the case of people who've been wounded early in life, they might say, God, how could you have let me get so messed up by these people? Now, how do you expect me to serve you? It isn't fair. Or where were you when I needed you? Or why me, God? And so on. Our hearts cries being as infinite as the problems we get into. For that reason, in Job 9.33, Job cried out, Neither is there any daysman between us that might lay his hand upon us both. You might not be familiar with that word daysman, but John's going to expand on it now. A daysman was the same as a prayer minister in Bible time. Men went to such a man to settle disputes, just like when the two women made King Solomon their daysman in their dispute over whose baby was whose. That's 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 16 to 28. Such a prayer minister or daysman talked to both parties, reasoned with them, and having settled the dispute, he'd lay his hands on both their shoulders and draw them together for forgiveness. Job's cry calls for our Lord Jesus Christ to become our daysman between God and man. And that's what 2 Corinthians 5.18 says he is, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Observe in that last phrase of the quote, Paul speaks of our being reconciled to God, not God being reconciled to us. We need to be reconciled to God because we've been angry with him. In the next phrase, the Holy Spirit speaks of his forgiving us because he says not counting our trespasses against us. That's the function of the daysman, to lay his hand on each one and so make mutual forgiveness and peace. Jesus is our daysman. Through him, we are to enable forgiveness between God and man both ways. So that brings us to the end of the teaching. We have found it to be an incredibly valuable tool in the toolbox of trying to help people in their process of transformation. I just want to end with the prayer that John and Paula give in their book. It's called The Prayer for Forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus, for taking forgiveness out of my hands. It's not an option. You simply said I have to do it. Yet I can't even do that. Do for me what I cannot do for myself. By myself, I cannot forgive. But for your sake, Jesus, I choose to do it as an act of my will. I give you any right I feel was mine to throw people, even myself, into a debtor's prison. Lord, I release them. I forgive them for what they did. Jesus, I stand here before you now as my counselor, as witness, and confess that they owe me nothing. I give you the right to hold them accountable for their actions. Lord, dismantle the prison that I built for others. Release me from trying to make up for mistakes I've made, the prison of trying to be worthy. You alone are my worthy. I give you my feelings of unworthiness. Help me to forgive myself for what I did or did not do. Help me to forgive myself. Release me to receive the forgiveness you want to give. I give you the right to hold me accountable for my actions. You know what to require of me and others and when to give mercy. And I release you, Lord, from the expectations that I've had of you. Your ways are not my ways. I can never wrap my mind around forgiveness. I don't understand it, and I don't know how it works. When you didn't do what I expected or wanted of you, I became angry, and I resented you. I forgive you, Lord, for what I perceive to be sins of omission on your part. Forgive me, Lord, for my anger and resentment, and help me accept you and your ways. Teach me your ways. I hate to admit it but I often want those who hurt me to hurt like I do. I want them to know the enormity of what they do to me, and I want them to be sorry for that. But that's vengeance, and that's your territory. So forgive me for trying to take your place. Forgive my desire for vengeance. Thank you that I don't have to pretend it's all right, or pretend that it doesn't hurt, or pretend that it doesn't matter. Thank you for listening to my expression of pain, my hurt, my sin. It all matters to you so much so that you provide a forgiveness for my healing. Lord, wash my mind and my spirit and my emotions of the acid of pain, resentment, and anger, and clothe me in your righteousness. I know my emotions will heal in time, and in time I'll be able to forgive emotionally as well. I'll be able to feel the emotion of being forgiven and of extending forgiveness. Until then, Lord, keep mending my wounded spirit and my bruised emotions. Thank you for taking care of the legal aspects of forgiveness. 
and for restoring my relationships with others, with you, and with the Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.